What's up guys and welcome back to the channel. If you've been wholesaling for any amount of time, you've probably spent days, maybe even weeks on a deal only for it to completely fall apart. Today I'm telling you guys about a recent deal where that exact thing happened to me and also what you can do if a seller is absolutely livid that your offer comes in much lower than they were expecting. I recently posted this video which talks about a very common new wholesaler mistake which is spending too much time on a deal where the seller either isn't very motivated or the property isn't very distressed. And while that is a common mistake, there will be situations where you have a seemingly very motivated seller, you have a seemingly very distressed property, and it's still just something isn't clicking. I work on dozens of properties a month and I chose this one to share with you guys because it's not all about the ones that are successful and the deals that go well, it's also about the deals that just don't work out and you kind of feel like you wasted your time on them. So the property I'm talking about today was listed on market for an as is $130,000 sale. And if you watched this vlog, you actually saw when I met the listing agent there and walked through the property. If you haven't seen that one yet, I will put a link in the description for you to watch it later. Just by looking at the pictures, you can see it needs quite a bit of cosmetic updating and when I spoke to the listing agent, I also found out that it needs a new roof, has some siding damage from a recent hailstorm, and also has termite damage that needs to be repaired and has kind of messed up the foundation. So this is a big project and while the renovation budget is gonna be pretty big, that's not the only part of the equation that matters. We also have to think about what the ARV is or the after repair value to get an idea of once all of that is fixed, what could this property be worth? Finding comps can be difficult and this is something that we spend a lot of time working on at my five day beginners bootcamp where I hop on Zoom with you guys and we practice running ARV and finding comps on multiple different properties all across the country. So if that's something you're interested in, I will leave a link to that in the description below. For this property, I found two really good comps, both completely renovated and one sold in November for $170,000, which was $124 a square foot. And the other one was also completely updated and it sold for $201,000, which was $130 a square foot. So just doing some quick numbers, if one property sold for $124 a square foot and the other comp sold for 130, then that means we can probably expect ours to be on average sell for around $127 a square foot. Just added those two together, took the average. Now, our property is 1148 square feet. So our property, if it sold for $127 a square foot, times that 1148 could possibly sell for somewhere around 145,000, maybe a little bit more because it is on the smaller end. So somewhere between 145, maybe $150,000 once all fixed up. I also estimated that all of the rehab that needs to be done in this property would probably cost somewhere around 35, $40,000. Most people use the 75% or 80% rule. And what that means is we take that ARV, so our $150,000 ARV that we got from looking at our comps, and we multiply that by, let's say, 80%. That gets us down to $120,000, and then off of that, we take off our rehab budget, we said $40,000, and that puts us right at $80,000. Now, if you want to work in a wholesale fee for yourself, then you need to also subtract off of that. So if you wanted to make $5,000, you would offer the seller $75,000. If you wanted to make $10,000, you would offer the seller $70,000. And in this case, the property was listed for $130,000, which was way too high. And so I ended up offering the seller $75,000. At first, I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to keep this property for myself and try to renovate it and burr it using a hard money loan, or if I wanted to just wholesale it to another investor. But either way, I would either wholesale it and make maybe five or $10,000 if I could find a good buyer, or I would keep it for myself and have a pretty good deal. But with that list price of 130,000, the seller rejected my $75,000 offer right off the bat, which was completely expected. But I knew that 130,000 was still way overpriced and each week I kept checking back in on this property and it wasn't selling. And the reason it wasn't selling was because it was priced way too high. So I offered 75,000 a few more times and I was hoping that the seller would at least negotiate with me and counter my offer and start a conversation, but through their listing agent, they just keep kept saying no and no and no. And eventually after a few weeks, when I text the listing agent, I got this text message back saying that the seller was not interested in doing business with me. And I thought the subtext of that message was that they thought my offers were way too low and they were sick of it. And to be honest, this is the first time I've had that happen where the seller is just like, stop talking to me. I've been beat out on plenty of offers 
offers where I offer something and somebody else offers more and gets the deal. But I've never actually had someone say, stop offering, I don't wanna do business with you. So that was an interesting situation. And to be honest, I'm not mad at it. I felt confident in the way that I had run my numbers and I knew that if I offered more, I might have gotten the, the property, but at that point it wouldn't have been a good deal because I would have overpaid for it or I wouldn't have been able to find a buyer to actually assign that contract to. So I guess the lesson here is that you can't force anyone to sell and you can't force yourself to ignore your numbers. Run your numbers, stick to them, and hopefully when you're dealing with a distressed property, the seller is motivated. And in this case, I thought that they were. The property was sitting on the market for a while and the agent was saying that they were getting pretty antsy to sell it, but they just weren't motivated enough to accept my offer or had a realistic understanding of, you know, what an investor would be willing to pay for their property given all of the damage that the property, you know, came with. And while you can't force anyone to be motivated, you can try to figure out the source of their motivation. And one good way to do that is to try to work out a creative financing deal. This could mean an owner finance or a subject to situation. And those were two things that I tried with this seller, but they really just wanted a lump sum of cash. They didn't want to do seller finance or subject to where they would have been getting a certain amount of money each month for a certain amount of years they weren't interested in that but sometimes that will help you get a deal done when the straight cash offer just it doesn't work for you or the seller it's good to try to find some other creative strategy that might work out if you want me to do a complete video on seller financing and other creative strategies leave your favorite emoji in the comment section below and when i was approaching the creative financing strategies i knew that i could either use one of those strategies to keep the property myself and renovate it and go forth in that method or you could still wholesale a creative financing contract for example i found a seller before who was interested in a subject to deal because they just wanted to be completely free of the property they didn't want to deal with it um, but the amount that they owed on the mortgage was too high for them to take a straight cash offer. And so I negotiated the seller finance and explained it to them and how everything would work out. And then I just assigned that contract to another investor who was gonna step in and do the seller financing deal with that owner. And I made an $8,500 assignment fee from that. So learning creative financing is really good whether you're trying to keep the property for yourself or if you're trying to still wholesale it. But at the end of the day, if the seller doesn't like any of the terms that you're offering, it may mean that it may not be the right deal for you or the right time for them. A lot of people say that the money is in the follow-up and I agree. This property was sitting on the market for weeks, months at the final point when they told me to stop offering and sometimes they will actually, you know, say yes and drop their price a little bit more because no one else has purchased it and sometimes they might just tell you to shoot. Now someone did eventually buy this property for $110,000 which was $20,000 less than the listing price but still far higher than I was willing to buy it for and I say good for the seller. I'm glad that they got the amount of money that they were comfortable with but I did not feel comfortable putting the property with that much work needed and with those comps at that level under contract but hey somebody else did it and maybe they'll be successful. And the fact that this property did eventually sell brings me to my final lesson which is find more and or better buyers. The more buyers that you can build relationships with, the more people you will possibly have to buy a deal from you. And casting a wider net means that you may have more experienced investors who are willing to take on such a big rehab project like this one. And to take that a step further, the better and more experienced your buyers are, the more willing they'll be to take on a big rehab, yes, but the better they'll also be able to tell you exactly their criteria for buying deals so you can feel more confident putting properties under contract because you know it abides by the rules and you know the way that your buyers are analyzing their deals and they'll be willing to buy it from you as long as it meets their criteria. I wasn't confident putting this property under contract because I didn't know any buyers that would buy it at any of a higher criteria than I used, which was the 80% rule in this case. Also, having good relationships with buyers just means that you'll get more experience about what's a good deal and what's not, and you'll know where to spend your time and continuously follow up, and when a deal is just one that you should probably move on from. Tell me in the comments below, how many offers do you make per month, and have you ever had a seller get really mad because they thought you were lowballing them? I look forward to reading your comments. Don't forget to change the color of the like button before you go, and until next time, thanks for watching.